Good afternoon. It's nice to see you all again. So we're now in week five, and this unit is on motivation, which is about why we do what we do. So motivation, the term motivation, refers to a need or desire that energizes and directs behavior. And so people have been able to train rats to push levers and cats to take to shake hands. But what does a rat really want to do with a lever? And what does a, a cat care about etiquette? They don't. But what the trainer, who's an amateur psychologist, is, is doing is leveraging something that the animal has a natural desire for, right? a natural instinct for. Okay. So what would what would the trainer be using to get the rat to push the lever or the cat? Yes. Food. food. Yeah. They like food. You can, use, you can use other things. Um rats will can be trained to push a lever to avoid an electric shock. And rats that care about other rats might push a lever to stop another rat from being getting an electric shock. So the most basic motivations, which are, are known as the four Fs, uh, have to do with survival and reproduction. They're, they're very primal. And these are the four basic, most primal drives. Those are motivations, instincts that, that animals, including humans, are evolutionarily adapted to have, to follow, and to achieve. I'm hearing some background noise. Can we keep the whispering down, please? You can text each other. Thank you. Okay. So food is a big one. Fighting and aggression is how we claim resources, fight off those who would take them away from us. Fleeing, we have a safety motivation. So we want to feel safe, might feel anxious and distressed until we're somewhere when we feel safe again. And then there is uh, fornicating. This is a brain that has been completely mapped out. It's, it's a very complex brain, contains 20 million synapses and 25,000 neurons. It doesn't look like a human brain, does it? have a map of that brain. So the behavior of a fruit fly isn't too complex. It's complex enough for psychologists to be interested in it and to, to learn from it. They're, uh, they're very into bananas and their, their cognitive ability isn't that high. You can't really say that a fruit fly is an intelligence because intelligence is about adaptive behavior and, and they can find the banana. So they're doing what they need to do but you can outwit them, right? Their cognitive ability is, is not that high. And so you can outwit them with those vinegar traps and sticky tape. You might wonder what do fruit flies spend most of their time doing? And, and psychologists have actually studied this, okay? Well, they, they feed and they fight. So that picture there is of two males boxing each other. They, they flee. And they spend most of their time fornicating. So what's going on there is, in the first picture, is the male's leg display to the female. And he has six of those. He shows those first. And then the next one is uh, elbow rubbing. See if she likes that. And then things keep heating up. They have the kind of a belly vibrating. He puts his legs on her belly and vibrates it. And if that all works out for him, they get it on. But females reject most of the advances of males. So certain motivations seem to be hardwired. And they're different for different animals because different animals have evolved to survive in using different methods in different environments. So cats evolved to be solitary hunters in a particular territory and 
historically, the environments the cats are from are pretty harsh, and you can't have too many cats in one place because there's not enough mice to go around. So that's why they don't really like other cats. But if you get a kitten, like what is what does it spend all its time doing? Like what does it do for fun? Well, it probably chases things and climbs things and pounces on things and generally just attacks things because a, the cat is a predator and those are hunting instincts and aggression is how it engages with the world, okay? And it's applying those hunting instincts to your couch cushions and to your feet. A rabbit just isn't interested in doing those things. Right? A rabbit is not motivated to chase a laser pointer, right? And neither are you guys. Not working, okay? So it, it's just not motivated to do that. Right? It doesn't have a hunting instinct. Now, dogs are also predators, but they evolved to hunt in packs that move across large territories in social groups. And unlike cats, dogs are social animals and they care about what you, your approval and what you want and whether you're pleased with them or not. And they'll be loyal to you. There are stories about dogs that have traveled like thousands of miles to be with a family that moved. And those are real stories. There are also some stories about cats that did that. But what happened in the cat stories is that the cat was sent to live somewhere else and the cat was going back to its original territory because cats are attached to their territory, but to a dog, its home is wherever you are. So a, a cat won't sort of naturally follow you to a new territory on their own accord like a dog will. If you walk away from a cat, your house will follow you for a bit, but they start to get pretty scared after what, like maybe one block and, and then they run home. And, and if you want to take them somewhere, you can put them in a carrier and take them with you, and they're very upset about that. Humans and dogs, who are social animals, will adopt and befriend other animals that aren't even members of their species. So humans adopt dogs, and packs of dogs have adopted human children. Okay, I, I've never seen a cat be like, I'll, I'll love and cherish this sweet mousy. And their instincts are different. So, what the instinct is, is towards is an incentive. An incentive is a positive or negative environmental stimulus that motivates behavior. Ladies, can you do that somewhere else? Maybe? Thank you. Food is a positive environmental stimulus and what does positive mean? That's a word we throw around a lot in psychology. It means a lot of different things. In this context, it means we want to approach it. We want to go toward it. We want to have it. We want to engage it. So most rats and cats, most of the time, are very interested in food. So for them, food is an incentive. But if the animal was completely full, Okay, if it was stuffed with food, then the food would lose its status as an incentive until the animal was hungry again, right? But while the animal was full, that food doesn't have any motivational potential, okay? Pineapple is not an incentive for cats, even though it's food, right? In their opinion, that's just not food. An electric shock is a negative environmental stimulus. It's a, a negative incentive. We want to get away from it. So most animals don't like being subject to electric shocks and they're motivated to run away or to do something like push a lever to stop the shock. However, if that animal had no pain receptors or it was anesthetized or pumped full of morphine, then it wouldn't care. And it wouldn't be an incentive anymore. So for something to be considered an incentive, it has to motivate behavior, it has to result in some kind of an action that's about trying to get it or trying to get away from it. Here are four perspectives on motivation. 
So one of those is instinct theory. It's an evolutionary perspective. And the idea is that your genes predispose you to some species typical behaviors. You don't have to teach a cat to chase anything. It just knows how to do that. Okay. Um, some birds are predisposed to imprint on the first thing that they see. That's usually their, their mother duck or their mother goose. And then they follow the mother around. But um, research psychologists have experimented with this. And if the first thing they see is a, a ball, they'll follow a bouncing ball. If the first thing they see is a researcher, then they will follow the researcher, as was the case with Con Conrad Lawrence famously. Then there's drive reduction theory. That's the idea that your body wants to be in homeostasis, right? So let's say your body wants to be adequately hydrated, not dehydrated or in water poisoning, which is what happens if you drink way, way, way too much water, it wants to be in just the right place. And so if, if your body is out of balance in some way, then you have a drive to do something in order to restore that balance. So if you're thirsty, then you're motivated to find water and drinking it will feel good. There's a, a reward for that. Um, Thorndike was a psychologist who famously put hungry cats in, in puzzle boxes to try to get them to figure out, see if they could figure out how to get out of the box. And in order to do that, he had to make the cat hungry and, and use that, the motivational force of, of hunger for the cat to figure out the problem. So there's fish on the other side. But if the cat wasn't hungry, like what would it do? It would probably like lick its butt and go to sleep because it's a cat and it's a box. Okay. So Thorndike had to create that imbalance by, by starving the cat so that he could leverage the cat's motivation to go and satisfy that out of balance situation. Arousal theory gets at the idea that there's a right level of stimulation. So if you were all alone in a padded cell with no one to talk to and nothing to do, you probably wouldn't be very happy about that. Okay? And you might find yourself doing something in order to feel better. And psychology undergraduates were left with electric pens that have an electric shock capacity. Um, left alone in a room with them will eventually start shocking themselves. And maybe that's to increase their level of stimulation. So maybe there's an optimal state of arousal. But then, Let's say that you had way, way, way too much stimulation, right? way too much light, way too much noise, way too much talking, then that would wear you out. And so we propose that people are motivated in behaviors that increase or decrease their arousal level in order to get the right level of arousal, okay? So if you're, kind of overstimulated, then maybe you're motivated to engage in behaviors that will lower those levels. And if your arousal is too low, okay, then you are motivated to engage in activities that increase your arousal, like often through curiosity. You might do something to stimulate yourself, go to a party, play a game. So extroverts, more of that latter pattern, and introverts have the former pattern, which is introversion and extroversion are related to baseline cortical arousal. Now, then there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's in, in your textbook, and it's in many other intro psych textbooks, and in management textbooks. It's popular, and it's well known. So you've done like sociology research and management training, and you hear about it in, in higher education, like right here and now. And the general idea is that there are basic needs that you have to meet before you're interested in the higher level, more complex needs, like 
self-actualization, being your true self, achieving your full potential. It's not without merit. It, it makes sense that your basic physiological needs kind of proceed and have priority over the more abstract ones. And so it puts physiological needs on the bottom, and then that's followed by safety needs, and then it has belonging, and then the psychological needs of like self-esteem and self-actualization. Um, it has some limitations. It's not empirically validated. One problem is, what do you mean by need? It's a word we throw around a lot. So a drive and a need aren't the same thing. You have a sex drive. It might even be very distracting, but sex is not a need. And sometimes when we when we call things needs, when they're really desires, then we can get a sense of entitlement because we think other people are responsible for fulfilling this need so that we can be well, right? So I agree that, ooh, must be my email. I agree that food is a human need and so is air and water and going to the toilet and, and having shelter from the elements, but, is, is sex a need? I don't know. It's a drive. It's a motivator. It's rewarding. And we can be very driven, even strongly driven, towards things that we don't need. I'm, I'm questioning what a, what a psychological need is. Like, what do we mean by that? Does it mean that if we don't have it, we will be psychologically destroyed? We will go mad. That is the case sometimes. It's the case for stimulation. So there are things called sensory deprivation chambers. Or sen and there are sensory deprivation techniques where people can stop you from seeing or hearing or feeling. And these are used to torture people because you actually will go nuts. And you no, know, it's not very long. Like maybe after half an hour, like you start hallucinating. It's a, a very, very upsetting experience. Okay. Solitary confinement is, is a form of punishment. So I would buy that stimulation and some society are legitimate psychological needs. But then what about the esteem needs? Things like pursuing achievement and mastery and respect and competence and becoming confident. So that's one place where I'm, I'm concerned about that we can rationalize a sense of entitlement by calling something a need. And the idea is that without this, without this need, then our well-being will be critically harmed. And I see some of that attitude in industrial organizational psychology, where let's say someone might feel that they need students to address them by a title because, oh, what is that? Sorry. There's feedback. Do you get that? I'm gonna have to do something about that. Sorry. I'm so sorry. This won't turn off. Oh, is it? That's over here. Okay. I'll give you a moment. <laughs> Testing. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Thanks. All right. So, so, so here is an argument that that I've heard before. Okay, so, so let's say you don't address me by a title. Well, I need a respectful workplace. And if I am exposed to incivility, my well being and productivity will be harmed. So now this is a management issue. And I see that kind of attitude in cases of, of, work, of workplace bullying. So Maslow's hierarchy isn't evidence based, it's a theory. A lot of theories in psychology offer some merit and they're a bit confounded and we overgeneralize them. And, and this, is, this is no exception. So people have broken the rules if these were rules. So people in concentration camps have given up their own food to save someone else. Right? Research in psychology strongly suggests that pursuing esteem needs is actually really problematic and bad for your well-being and your productivity, okay? You're better off simply esteeming yourself now as you are now because you have enough and you are enough and you do enough. 
And not everyone needs or, or wants to be confident. Like look at the words they have there, like confidence, achievement, mastery, right? Or in charge. Like some people prefer dependence and interdependence. And then so why do you need achievement, right? Is well-being constant striving? Some people think it is. I, I see a lot of people who are the dysfunctional workaholics, not because, you know, they, they have love and belonging, but because they're afraid that they don't. It's like they don't have that foundational needs and they're trying to meet it some other way. And it's like, that's why they're working so hard to impress other people, but it's bottomless. Anyway, so you see self-actualization at the top. And this is an idea of achieving your full potential and being everything that you can be. And well, that's kind of vague. What does that mean? Right. And what does it mean for other people? Like, do you have to have disproportionate access to resources to do it, to pursue your passion, say? Would everyone else have to be investing in your talents and doing the drudge work while you pursue your passion? So I think that focusing on or getting to self-actualization, if that concept even makes sense, assumes a lot of privilege. It assumes a lot of power. Power is the ability to do stuff, and this is to do what you want, okay? And, and a lot of latitude for self-determination. We have a lot of latitude for self-determination to say, oh, maybe I should be this or that, and I don't want to do the other thing. But some people are just born into circumstances where what you do is go work at the factory or on right the, or the rice paddy. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs has taken on a life of its own in introductory psychology and management texts. And textbooks can present ideas very differently than in the original writings. And in fact, the original author of a theory might be really surprised to read what they say about it in a textbook because the textbook is written by someone else maybe five someone else's and a team of editors and they start putting their own interpretation and perceptions and experience into it okay and they might not even be reading the original writings they might be citing someone else who interpreted it and it could be an interpretation of an interpretation and that can run many layers deep so you know why do we teach it when maslow never even represented his own work as a pyramid it was one of the interpreters created the pyramid in like 1960. well it looks good on a powerpoint slide you can make multiple choice test questions based on it i'm not sure how it even you know use this theory like when would I use Maslow's hierarchy? So some um, authors that researched this um, found that the hierarchy of needs was from an article by a consulting psychologist, that means an IO psychologist. And it appeared in his 1960 article on business for, in Business Horizons, how money motivates men, in which he argued the pyramid can be applied to generate maximum motivation at lowest cost. I haven't read that article, but it'd be interesting to do so. Maybe I should have done that. Sounds kind of capitalistic. So Maslow lived for 10 years after the pyramid thing came out and he never challenged it. It was very popular in the management community and probably in his own interests as a consultant to go along with it. Been invited to keynote speeches, that kind of thing. So we'll return to some of those more complex, higher level, more abstract psychological needs next lectures. And I'm going to focus on the more fundamental ones today. So one of the most fundamental needs and drives and passions is, as you suggested, food. Food is a very fundamental motivator. It's what we use to get rats to do things. So we automatically regulate our caloric intake through the homeostatic system that, that is regulated by the hypothalamus. We'll talk about parts of the brain later. But for now, there is a part of your brain that acts a bit like a thermostat. And it, it will make you want to eat if your calories have dropped too low. And 
It'll make you less interested in eating if you've had too much. <clears throat> uh, your textbook claims that uh, you can't feel blood glucose going low, and, and I don't buy that, and I don't think that they might be discussing drops within a normal range, but people can definitely feel a clinically low blood sugar, like they're shaking and dizziness. Your basal metabolic rate is the number of calories that is required to keep your body stable, like at rest. You're sedentary all the time. And you should always eat that much. Like if you're dieting, don't go below your basal metabolic rate because you need that just to function. And for most women, I think it's something like 1,200 or 1,500 calories. The set point is the point at which your body sort of wants to be. If, if there was a, a thermostat, it, it's set somewhere. And when your body falls below that weight, you'll feel increased hunger and uh, you'll have a, a lower metabolic rate to make it easier for you to gain weight. And if you go above that, the opposite happens. So the hypothalamus, which is colored orange over there, uh, performs various body maintenance functions. And one of that, those is control of hunger. And um, blood vessels supply the, the hypothalamus and enable it to respond to your current sort of blood chemistry right? and also to incoming neural information about the body state. So it's getting information from your blood and from your nerves. And if it detects somehow that you need food, then it secretes a hormone called orexin. It's like a chemical messenger and it makes you feel hungry. And in the picture of the mouse to the left, that animal has non-functioning receptors in the part of the hypothalamus that would suppress appetite if it had enough to eat. You see, it doesn't have that inhibitory function, so it keeps eating. Another hormone uh, is ghrelin, and that's a hormone that's secreted by the empty stomach. So if your stomach's empty, it secretes ghrelin, that makes you feel hungry. Some people get um, who have a uh, struggle with overeating, get a stomach reduction surgery, and then they can't eat as much, feel fuller, but it also reduces the amount of ghrelin that's produced. Your fat cells produce a hormone called leptin, okay? and the more fat you have, the more leptin is produced. And leptin causes your body to increase metabolism, which would burn more fat okay? and decrease hunger so that you eat less. So it basically says, right, you've eaten enough, you can go burn this energy. If you have very little fat, then you'll have low leptin levels. And so your metabolism will fall and that conserves energy and you'll be hungrier. Then there's PPY, peptide YY. And that is produced in the small intestine and it's released into the bloodstream to tell your brain that you're full. So you can see there's a lot of hormones that are involved in this. Yes. Um, how does it differ for people with autism spectrum disorder and ADHD? It's common to not feel hunger cues. Is that a biological difference or is that just a lack of understanding of um, autonomy and your body's That's processes. a fascinating question because you're getting at the difference between um, like sensation and, and perception. So if there's a, is there a higher level cognitive function that says, you know, I am hungry. I recognize this about myself and I ought to go eat. And I don't know. I never thought of that until like one second ago. I don't know if anyone else knows. So genes mostly determine why one person today is heavier than another. There is a genetic component to your body weight. 
but environment mostly determines why we on average are heavier than our counterparts would have been 50 years ago. So there's been there's a lot more food available, a lot more, a lot richer food available. And that's kind of pushed the entire distribution up. But there's still going to be variance in that distribution where some people have a set point that's higher and some people have a set point that's lower. And that's like all human diversity, probably a matter of having a population that can adapt to all different kinds of environments and changes in environments. And so people who conserve weight would have an advantage if there was right, a, a shortfall in food. Um, there are some other environmental changes. We get less sleep than we should. You know, back in the day, you went to sleep with the sun and maybe got up with the sun, or maybe had candles, and those are dangerous and don't produce that much light. But it's only quite very recently, I would say, in human history that we can you know, keep the lights on all night and have a phone in bed. And sleep loss does affect your hormones, and it causes a, a fall in leptin levels and a rise in ghrelin levels. And most people are sleep deprived. So we, we can talk about what the word normal means and whether normal is good. Most people are probably vitamin D deficient. So you don't get out in the sun enough. And most people are a little sleep deprived. And then we also generally have lower activity levels because we have cars now and uh, increased foods, uh, food consumption. There are some food preferences that seem genetic. There are most people like sweet tastes and salty tastes. Um, eating carbohydrates makes many people feel calmer, kind of rewarding. And there's still diversity, right? And um, there's a preference for spicier foods in hotter climates. And that might have something to do with the fact that it's very good for preservation, especially of meat. Pregnant women develop all kinds of taste cravings or aversions that have to do with what uh, she should be getting for the, the fetus or, or not getting. If a food is healthy, even if it doesn't taste sweet or salty, say it has some weird bitter taste, but if it's still healthy and nutritious and non-toxic, then it's adaptive to learn to like it, even if it tastes bad, and to even come to like that taste. And so there's all kinds of foods that people eat at different places, parts of the world that we might find surprising, but are considered delicacies. Um, that's, uh, that's natto, it's kind of fermented, is it soybean? Um, cheese surprises folks from other cultures where they don't eat that, where they don't eat a lot of dairy. We think it's delicious. Um, the Inuit people will eat some um, seals that are, you know, they're, they're not the freshest. Okay. And that's considered a, a delicacy. Many cultures eat insects. We have a thing about bugs, but actually they're quite healthy, very lean sources of protein. You're eating the whole animal to get all the organs. So there's lots of micronutrients. It's actually a pretty great idea. Now, um, this is this fruit's supposed to be uh, a delicacy. I can't remember the name of it. Sorry? Is it, is it called jackfruit? Okay. I, I think it's, I hear that it's supposed to be like, like a really disgusting smell and then, or taste, but you can learn to like it. Yeah. Yeah. It's considered like, like awful, like something dead, but yeah. And then it, it's delicious in, to folks in other cultures, which is fascinating. Uh, this one is, is one of the weirder European foods, which is like cheese that's covered in maggots. Apparently, if, if you eat it in a, in a sandwich, you have to um, 
they can jump. So it's usually served on bread. And so you have to hold your hand over the sandwich to stop them from like jumping at you. I don't know. Consider it a delicacy. Um, there are also social, environmental, situational influences on, on eating. Something that's a, a cultural thing in Canada and the United States is huge servings of food. That's something that when I've had relatives from, from Europe, they just they can't believe like what you're served at a restaurant. And when I went um, on a conference to Houston, I, I was stunned by like the size of cookies and, and muffins. Like the cookies were like, like that big. In Europe, you see smaller sizes. And, you know, I, I don't know what that's about. Something cultural. It might be a way of saying we have so much abundance here that if you buy a plate of food, there's enough for you to take home. Hey. Um, you'll also eat more if you're around other people who are eating. It's kind of socially contagious. And if there's more variety. The textbook is missing, I think, an important point around culture and nutrition. They, they seem concerned, very concerned about weight in the textbook. It's an American textbook and body weight is maybe more of a concern there. Um, they seem to suggest or imply that obesity comes from eating too much. And the problem is that you're just eating too much and, and need to eat less. And if people are overeating, then one of the reasons that can be is if they're eating a lot of, say, refined food because then it never really, you don't feel really full, like you still always have a hankering for something. So because it feels like you're missing something because you are. If you eat enough like protein and fiber and nutritious food, food that has a lot of different micronutrients, we all get enough protein, we all get enough fat, we all get enough carbohydrate. But if you eat something like, spinach, there's, there's a lot of other compounds in there that are called micronutrients. And so you can be kind of overfed, but undernourished. And, and if you eat really nutritious food, then you won't get cravings the way you would if somebody would if they were on um, a more refined diet. It's actually really hard to try to lose weight by forcing yourself to eat like less of a low quality diet. Like I imagine that could be maddening. This diet over here is called the SAD, the SAD, the Standard American Diet. And it is kind of unfortunate. There's a lot of processed food, a lot of processed grain, like white flour, processed meat and cheese, a lot of refined oils, and a lot of sugar. Right? Like a lot of people think that Nutrigrain bars and granola bars are healthy because there's some oats in there. There's also like a ton of sugar, okay? You go to Tim Hortons, McDonald's and get a blueberry muffin. Those aren't real blueberries. There's, there's little dough balls that they dye blue and put extra sugar and flavor in. And they bake those in because they're not gonna spend the money on real blueberries, okay? The most common vegetables in the American diet are potatoes and corn, and corn is not actually a vegetable. It's a grain. There was a school district that actually tried to pass off the ketchup um, as, as a vegetable to say they were in compliance with uh, like food guide guidelines. I guess tomatoes are a vegetable. So there, there are many variations of, of what a healthy diet looks like, and they look something like this. And that's not how most people eat, okay? So this is the Canada Food Guide. And what this is saying is that half your plate should be fruits and vegetables. Who does that, right? For breakfast and lunch and dinner, if there was a pyramid, like vegetables and fruits would be on the bottom of it. I'm hearing a lot of whispering I have no problem with you guys not listening, but whispering does make it, it comes through on the recordings and it, it makes it more difficult to lecture. Anyway, okay, 
that's this these diets here have a lot of different micronutrients okay and in all those and, and different ones in all the different colors so this really does matter to your well-being don't memorize this we'll talk about neurotransmitters in a later unit for now, what I'll say is that your nervous system relies on neurotransmitters to function. It's part of the electrical, electrochemical signaling of your body. Okay, we'll talk about those in the unit on biological psychology, but they have different functions. And so serotonin has a lot to do with mood and sleep. Um, medications for anxiety tend to increase work on your, your GABA ergic system. Okay. The major, major neurotransmitter for um, excitatory communication, there's excitatory and inhibitory communication. We'll deal with that later. It's glutamate, which you find in, in foods, in umami tasting foods. Okay. Dopamine is behind your reward system. It has a lot to do with motivation. And as you can see from those lists, these are things that you your body uses precursors, chemical precursors that it finds in foods in order to build those neurotransmitters. And do you see potato chips on that list, right? Do you see like white bread on that list? No, it's, it's all these vegetables and high quality proteins. Um, there are different cultural preferences around body weight um early human this is an early human sculpture like from way back in, in the day and it seems to to prefer like a, a larger body size even a hundred years ago in western europe much heavier female figures were preferred um and there was a time when i was younger that being really really thin was was the thing and so there are different standards for, for beauty and, and what's that about? Well, we could speculate that it has something to do with socioeconomic status of signaling wealth. So in the West, a land of abundance, being richer means being thinner because that's the harder thing to do. So you need to access higher quality, more expensive foods and, I don't know, demonstrate self-discipline, okay? And also a lot of education. And in some other places in the world, being rich, being wealthy actually means being fat. Maybe places where there is more scarcity. So in Mauritania, there's a beauty ideal of obesity. And, and women would laugh at and be horrified by the bottles that, that we have on our magazine. And, and in fact, they have, right? They would have the perception that Western beauty models look ill. And um, I don't know if it's all culture, like it can be hard to tease out nature versus nurture. So these um, Europeans, so, so these preferences were known, were there, let's say before European contact, they're still observed in, in black men in the United States. So it's possible that certain groups have a hardwired preference, right, for, for larger body sizes. And they're men of all races, including white men who simply prefer larger figures, right? That diversity is there. Um, so if you really wanted to disentangle that, you have to do twin studies and there wouldn't be much point of opportunity for that. So in Mauritania, there's a practice of, of force feeding girls to prepare them for marriage. And they might even use drugs to increase appetite and weight. And they might feel, thinner girls might feel inadequate and be teased by plumper peers and feel envious. This is a quote from your textbook, which I find has some pretty toxic attitudes. Obesity has been associated with increased depression, especially among women, and bullying, outranking race and sexual orientation as the biggest reason for youth bullying in Western cultures. And I pulled that quote from the thinking critical section. What do you guys think of that?
Why would I flag that? Yes. I think your voice is so clear that I probably don't even need it. How would they even really determine what the biggest reason for bullying is without kind of making big generalizations? Ah, I worked on a, a study where we did that. I worked on a, a study of cyberbullying and suicide, and, and I had to track down the reasons why these people were bullied. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I had to, to go like look that up in stories, and it often came down to some kind of misogyny. Yeah. Like sometimes people got bullied because they were gay. But then is like gayness a major cause of like depression and bullying? See how they're like flipping it around? Yeah. It sounds like the obesity is the cause yeah. and the reason. And it sounds almost like it's a justification for bullying somebody. Like, oh, well, you're being bullied. Well, the problem is that you're fat. That's what it's. What it it's does sound like that. Yeah. Thank you. So I would say that there's there's no excuse for bullying anyone ever, period. And whether it's over larger sized women being bullied in the West or the smaller sized women being bullied in Mauritania. Okay. So I would say that there's some, I perceive that there's some victim blaming there. Like if there's bullying and depression, maybe the problem is how we feel entitled to treat each other. Or maybe the problem is misogyny. There, if you're interested in supporting people with healthy behaviors, whatever that means, there is a subdiscipline of clinical psychology called health psychology that uses knowledge of psychology to promote healthy behavior. And that might be something like smoking cessation. Some folks uh, have to follow very, very complicated regimens and uh, that can be quite difficult. So people with chronic kidney disease have to follow a diet that is very, very restrictive. And how are you gonna do that in a context where, you know, they go to a reception and everyone's eating and they're offered all these foods they can't have. Or someone, you go somewhere and someone offers you a drink, but they have to watch their fluid levels. Ladies, please, thank you. I'm noticing a lot of this whispering thing. And it's like three different groups. So please, thank you. Um, compliance with treatment. So some people have to take insulin every day. And people live, you know, if they forget, it's a big problem. So there's people, there's psychologists that, that help with that. And then it can be difficult for people with disabilities or chronic illnesses to take care of themselves in a world that is, is not really built for that. Right? It's built, designed on the assumptions that, that everyone is healthy. And they can also uh, be involved in developing recommendations for public health and policy, and they can design clinical interventions. Eating disorders also come up. And um, eating disorders can be quite culturally specific, and there's something that we see more of in the West. Anorexia is about seriously limiting calories. It's about control. And there's can, the drive might even be more of an achievement motivation to be thin, to eat so little. Like today, I only ate 500. Tomorrow, I'll eat 300. That's really hard to achieve. So control could be an issue. Like, how can I show self-control by not eating? Um, bulimics will lose control and have a binge, might feel shame then, and then purge, which could be throwing up or exercising a lot, tries to reestablish that sense of control. If there's no, no purging, then there's, then you have binge eating disorder. Um, another one is orthorexia, which is a desire to only eat like pure foods, the very, very picky kind of clean eating. So it's like healthy eating taken to an unhealthy extreme, even to the point of malnutrition, right? The, where like the food has to be organic and local and unprocessed and vegan and raw until there's nothing left. Pika is a motivation to eat inedible foods. So things like species or metal 
or paint or drywall. Um, Michael Lotito was a man with Pika who made a, a career out of it. And his uh, condition was diagnosed at the age of nine when he started eating the family TV set. So they took him to the doctor. Okay. So he made it into a career. He, he ate a computer, he ate skis, he ate um, a coffin, um, an air, entire airplane, a bicycle. And uh, he's awarded a brass plaque by the Guinness Book of World Records. And he, he ate it. So the cause of pika is unclear. Like, you know, it, it's not just iron deficiency. That's not like the usual response to anemia. It is classified as a mental disorder. So there, the book goes kind of really deep into to food motivation. And then they kind of, they don't talk about some of the other basic motivations. So there's like, um, so feeding, food, fight, flight, and they don't, they kind of skip over those. They don't talk about fight and flight. So one of the basic motivations is, is in social animals, I'd say, is dominance, right? Fighting is one of the four Fs. So it's not discussed in the textbook, but aggression is a basic instinct. It's how we claim and defend resources and protect ourselves from threats. So the reason why social animals have social dominance hierarchies, like pecking orders, is actually to reduce the overall amount of aggression in the group. Because members of a species will have dominance contests with each other to establish, you know, who's the, the dominant chicken or whatever it is. And once those contests have taken place and everyone in the group knows their place, then there is an overall reduction in the amount of aggression in the group. And then the, uh, I don't know, alpha male just gets most of the food and everyone understands that. Okay, that's what dominance hierarchies do. So then the group can, can get on with things. But if you add a new chicken or worse yet, a new rooster to the flock, then it's sort of a, a bit of a kerfuffle until that order is reestablished again. Power is a motivator. That's why your profs power trip on you and the administration power trips on us. People like it, they enjoy doing that. So I'll cover the psychology of dominance and submission in the unit on social psychology, but a dominant disagreeable person is motivated, more motivated to fight right? for themselves, for people that they care about. And a submissive or agreeable person is has a bit more of a safety motivation. So they're more conflict avoidant. So fleeing is, is one of those four Fs. Right? One of the basic motivations is safety motivation. And researchers can teach animals to do something like push a lever to avoid an electric shock. So we're motivated to avoid harm, to be safe and to feel secure. Right? That's why electric fences work. And the textbook doesn't cover this one either. However, uh, safety motivation and safety leadership happens to be Diana's area of expertise. So I asked her to help out and she kindly provided a mini guest lecture on the subject. Hi everyone. So today I'll be covering the concept of safety motivation as a subtopic of general motivation. Uh, but before I get into it, I just wanted to note that safety motivation is quite a complex topic uh, and looks different depending on what area of psychology you're actually focusing on. Uh, with that being said, I try to cover as much as possible and kind of the interesting parts of safety motivation. Uh, but please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you want any more information on, on anything that I mentioned in the slideshow. So before getting into it, just to provide a very brief outline of what I'll be talking about, uh, I first want to start talking about general basic animal safety motivation as kind of a foundation uh, before I get into something a little bit more complex, which is human safety motivation. I'll follow this by going into the self-determination theory, which is a theory uh, that helps kind of explain uh, safety mo motivation as it is. And then finally, I will end off with an example um, in the workplace. 
Okay, so as mentioned, we'll first start off by looking at an animal foundation. So what does safety look like in animals? And this kind of has three components, uh, detecting predators, avoiding predators, and surviving encounters. And I'll get into a bit of detail on each of these now. The first one is the most straightforward. It's just detecting predators. So just think of a deer looking out into the horizon to see if there's any predators around or hearing out for um, predators in the distance. If you are, for instance, a caterpillar, this could be a more tactile method. So just feeling the ground to see if there's any threat nearby. Uh, the second category is avoiding predators. So this is avoiding encountering threat. And it could be done by avoiding a place where you know there is predators around. It could be remaining silent or as this octopus is doing in this picture, blending in with its surroundings. Uh, the final one is surviving encounters. So this is your fight or flight instinct. When you encounter your predator, are you going to kind of battle it off or are you going to try run away? Or as this possum is doing here, and this is a real thing, uh, playing dead. So whenever they encounter a predator, so let's say a bear for instance, uh, they drop to the ground and just pretend that they are dead in hopes of um, the bear going away. And this is a real thing. So what makes animals motivated to be safe is in order to increase both their chances of survival and their chances of reproduction. So they have an instinct drive in order to avoid danger and to protect themselves in order to ensure that they live long enough in order to pass down their genes to future generations. So very, very simple here. It is practically just to pass on their genes and it's very, um, focus on physical safety in, in terms of animals. So is this the same reason that humans act safely? The short answer is yes and no. Uh, the long answer is much more complex, but kind of the foundation is humans are motivated to act safe in order to pass down their genes, just as all animals are. But because we have a more highly developed brain and we're able to process emotion, our motivation is uh, a bit more complex than other animals. With that being said, what actually is safety in humans? And as you can see here, we have a long list of safety concepts. Uh, the first one being physical safety. So this is something we do have in common with animals, and it refers to the absence of harm, injury, or danger in one's surroundings. So again, kind of that avoiding threats and predators in our environment. Uh, the rest of them aren't very relevant to animals, but again, very specific to humans as we have uh, kind of emotional capabilities. So the second form of safety is emotional safety, uh, and this refers to a sense of security and well-being in one's relationships and social environments. So being able to form bonds with friends and family is a form of safety. Uh, the third one is psychological safety, and this is very similar to emotional safety, uh, but it refers to the sense a, of trust and confidence in one's ability to effectively manage stress, um, challenges, and adversity. Fourth, financial safety. So this refers to having a sense of security and stability in one's financial life. So being able to have a job that allows you to provide to your friends and your, to yourself and your family. And finally, environmental safety, and this refers to having access to clean air and water uh, and healthy and safe foods as well. So again, there, although there is some overlap with um, safety in animals, it does take a more complex view when we're looking at humans. But kind of a general theme that we're seeing here is that each aspect of safety is making the quality of our life better and making it easier for us to pass down our genes and to survive, um, which again is kind of that same foundation we've been seeing throughout. So humans are motivated to act safely for a variety of reasons that I have listed here. Uh, the first one is for self-preservation. So this is just a basic instinct that motivates humans to avoid danger and to protect themselves from harm. Uh, we also have an innate desire to protect others, and it's often driven by empathy and a sense of compassion. So this is very uh, specific. I don't want to say specific to humans, but not many animals uh, kind of have the sense of empathy or uh, instinct to kind of protect those around them. 
Uh, third, social norms and cultural values also play a pretty big role in shaping safety behavior. So people often conform or kind of go towards what everybody else is doing or what everybody else finds acceptable or desirable in their society. And this motivates us to be safe. Uh, and finally, moral principles. So many individuals are motivated by more moral or ethical considerations. Uh, so for instance, the desire to do what is right um, and the desire to not cause harm to others. Moving on, I wanted to highlight one theory that often appears in the literature in order to explain kind of the how and why safety motivation works, so the mechanism through which it works, and that's the self-determination theory. And self-determination theory states that we have three basic psychological needs that have to be met. Uh, the first one being autonomy, so feeling like you have a choice in your own behavior. Uh, the second one being competence, so being able to have some mastery and being effective in one's behavior. And third, relatedness, so the, the need to feel connected to those around, around you. And all three of these components contribute um, or help explain motivation or differences in motivation in individuals. So researchers a while back took the concept of self-determination theory in order to develop these six types of motivation that I have listed here. Uh, and they're all based on varying degrees of those three psychological needs I just talked about. Uh, the first one is a motivation. So this is just a lack of motivation altogether. And this practically indicates that those three needs are just not being met whatsoever. So an individual doesn't have motivation to, to do to do much at all, actually. Uh, the second one is external. So this is driven primarily by rewards, by punishments. So for instance, um, kind of a money incentive uh, will kind of motivate somebody to, to do a certain behavior. Uh, the third one is interjected. So this is doing something because you feel like you should, as opposed to doing it because you, you feel like it's right or it's something you want to do. So for instance, if you think it's going to make your parents happy, that's kind of the motivation for you to do it. Fourth, it uh, is identified and this is driven by a sense of personal importance. So some you're, you're doing something because it's important to you. So you're motivated to run a marathon because this, this is something um, of great importance in your life. Uh, fifth is integrated, so driven by a sense of personal meaning. So being able to, this is very similar to integrated, uh, but it's practically characterized by a deep kind of personal investment in an activity or behavior, uh, and you, you have a strong connection to it. And lastly, you have intrinsic, so this is driven by an internal sense of satisfaction. So you're doing something because it makes, it makes you satisfied or happy um, or brings you joy. Okay, so moving on, I just wanted to do a very brief example or kind of activity uh, that showcases safety in the workplace. So this is kind of my field of expertise and where I see safety motivation the most. Um, but just to kind of give you a grasp of how those different types of motivations actually coincide in real life. Okay, so I have a little scenario written down here that states uh, you ask six employees at a construction company why they are motivated to work safely. And here is a summary of their answers. And again, this is just developed to showcase kind of how those six aspects of uh, motivation um, adhere in real life. So you ask the first employee why they work safely and their answer is that they don't want to get yelled at and being yelled at is a form of pu punishment. So in turn, the type of motivation we have here is external. And again, external is kind of that reward punishment conditioning uh, type. The next employee says straight up that they do not want to act safely at work. Uh, they, there's no reason why they should. They're, they're, they're just not motivated to do it at all. And of course, uh, this is a lack of motivation altogether. So this is an example of a motivation. The third employee says that they do it because they want to make their boss happy. Maybe in the future they're looking for some type of promotion or they just want to get on their boss's good side. Uh, so this is an example of introjected uh, motivation. So they're not necessarily doing it for themselves, but they're doing it for somebody else. Fourth, 
uh, this employee wants to work safely because it makes them happy. And this is a very great example of intrinsic motivation. So just doing something for personal, personal joy, it just makes them feel good. Uh, the fifth employee says uh, that they work safely in order to fulfill personal goals. So they have kind of a goal to, to be safe and by doing so, it's kind of helping them reach this goal. And this is an example of integrated. Uh, and finally, the last uh, employee says that they work safely because it's important to them. And this just showcases uh, their their values or a reflection of their identi identity. So this one is an identified um, example of safety motivation. Yeah, and this is uh, this is kind of what a lot of not necessarily my research, but research that I do with other individuals um, focuses on. And I just wanted to end off the lecture by showing some of the outcomes of uh, safety motivation. So those individuals who are highly motivated to be safe, again, the example is in the workplace, uh, kind, of, kind of the benefits that they have by doing so. Uh, and the benefits are both on an individual level, so they have personal benefits as well as a collective, so it impacts those around them, it impacts their organization um, in different kind of areas of their life. So some potential outcomes including physical safety. So Individuals who are highly motivated to act safe are actually experiencing less injuries and harm. So it's not kind of just this motivation, but it has uh, a real life outcome on how safe they actually act at work. Uh, second one, emotional well-being. So being highly motivated to be safe uh, has a positive impact on kind of their sense of security in their own life and uh, they, they have or they're less likely to experience fear, less likely to experience anxiety or, or stress altogether. Uh, third is increased productivity. So those who are highly motivated to be safe in the workplace actually work more effectively or efficiently than those who are less motivated. Fourth, improved relationships at work. So they have better bonds with their colleagues, they get along better with their boss, so on and so forth. Uh, and finally, financial benefits, and this is in terms of both the individual and the organization. So individuals who are highly motivated to act safe are more likely to get more money in their workplace, and they're also more likely to get their organization money as well, if that makes sense. So yeah, many benefits, both again on a personal level and an organizational level. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, if you have any questions or you want me to elaborate on any piece of information that I had here, feel free to email me. I have my email um, up on here, but obviously it's also in the syllabus. So yeah, thank you. Diana is a PhD student in industrial organizational psychology. So when she's talking about safety in the workplace, she's thinking of a kind of accidents that can can happen in places like factories, or I suppose it could be occupational health and safety concerns in any workplace. Um, that brings us to the end of the lecture about five minutes early. Are there any questions? No, good, okay. For, for next lecture, um, if you come, um, please be quiet when I'm recording because all the, the noise gets into the recording and it takes three hours to edit one of these recordings and it's a lot of work on my end. So thank you.